Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you all see my screen now. Yes. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk with you about uh, the message broker approach with Hank Fire in .NET. So let's start and uh, short uh, introduce of myself. I am uh, senior .NET full stack engineer. I have five years of experience overall, and I'm working for two years at SoftServe already. And uh, my main project right now is the Hyloid uh, AMS system with multi-tenancy approach. So um, I want to start with uh, my one of my favorite uh, quotation by Albert Einstein. Uh, he said that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And this is a really powerful quotation because that's uh, the rule that I've been uh, uh, powered when I'm working with uh, my presentation for this topic. So what was the initial problem? Uh, the initial problem was that we uh, got a request from one of our customers to build a new separate logic on top of our current API. Uh, Speaking more specifically, we had to introduce uh, the sync approach to sync the data from one tenant to another. But since we were using the API versioning, we shouldn't create a new version of our API and uh, should follow some uh, further constraint. One of them is that uh, we sh uh, our new approach uh, should not affect API performance, uh, should not increase uh, API running time, uh, should uh, be consistently uh, consistent to uh, be consistently uh, working, so it doesn't affect current API consumers. So that we should introduce new contracts between our clients and servers. And uh, one of the, our possible approach was to uh, create a microservice architecture, but it was prohibited from the very beginning. So any separate deployable service is not an option at all. And uh, let's look at our um, old data transfer flow, uh, which uh, I just enable my laser pointer. So uh, this was the rough diagram of our application. So uh, everything starts with the public API, uh, which our client is requesting. Then it goes to a load balancer and we have uh, multiple proxy servers and each of them uh, has an access to one of uh, our instances of the main application which is just a pure app service in Azure. Each of them has an access to our single SQL server and MongoDB that we're using for like various needs. And uh, all of this is a um, single monolith architecture. That's why we didn't uh, allow to create a microservice approach since our client uh, didn't have any experience with that. So. It, it would be problematic for uh, our DevOps or client side to maintain all of these uh, things in Azure Cloud. So now let's talk about some of the possible solutions of the initial problem. So of course, the most common case is to introduce another deployable services, uh, which can be like SimCap service. Um, and our main core application can communicate with that uh, services by some message brokers, such as a RabbitMQ or uh, the Kafka provider, as I listed here, or even a Azure uh, storage account. We can divide our SQL servers by multiple instances uh, and uh, define another instance for specific needs for the SimCap service. But as I already said, this is too complicated and uh, it was declined by our customer, by our client. So this, but it wasn't an option at all for us. Uh, so let's talk about the simplest ways to do so uh, considering the monolith architecture. Of course, if you want to uh, introduce a new logic on top of your current API, you may think firstly about injecting a new services. So you may want to introduce a new interfaces, uh, implement them, uh, implement your uh, logic, and then just inject uh, your current API versions and call the appropriate methods uh, within your endpoints. And uh, that's it. It shouldn't uh, introduce new uh, request or response payload. It just does their job as a part of the current APIs. But the problem with that is that it will introduce another level of, uh, of uh, injection. So we'll inject multiple problem, multiple additional services. 
it creates uh, it increases uh, coupling uh, within one uh, endpoint or probably multiple endpoints. So uh, it's not it wasn't an option for us as well. Another thing is to create some sort of background workers so we can introduce some scheduling mechanism and um, schedule uh, the jobs to be executed on the background while uh, the standard and old APIs just run in uh, as they usually does. But the problem with that thing is that, yes, we should inject only one, uh, let's say, service that allows us to schedule jobs, but it will increase a cohesion between different parts and models uh, in our project, or maybe even between different projects in the same solution because this scheduling mechanism should know beforehand about uh, the specification of various methods that they should call uh, schedule and schedule uh, on the background. So yeah, this is not ideal option for us too. So what we came to, what was our solution? The solution was uh, pretty simple. We decided to introduce something like a message bus approach. So that allowed us to inject only one single interface in, uh, on our APIs. And uh, the beauty of this is that our API uh, wouldn't know nothing about uh, the specification uh, of the methods, about the contracts uh, between that API and something, some new code that should be run. It doesn't know anything about the way how it uh, should be run. It just takes the implementation of iMessage bus, the pretty standard one. Uh, we would have only one published method that will publish our events, and that's it. And response will return immediately to our main thread, and our API will continue work as uh, as it was before, as expected. So here's the new updated diagram of our data transfer flow. So this part remains the same. The only difference is that we had to introduce some uh, sort of a queue server. It can be a, a separate a deployable server or uh, it can run on the same domain and be as a part of the main application. So all the management can happen on the same host here. And um, nothing more specific. So no new SQL servers or Mongo databases or nothing else uh, is introduced here. And uh, the other thing is that we've been trying to think about uh, a specific technology that we want to use. And uh, during that time, we've been uh, thinking about that. Uh, we've tried to uh, make it distinguish between the different uh, schedulers, different libraries and frameworks that are used in .NET for uh, job scheduling and uh, different message brokers and how we can combine those two approaches to achieve the best result. So in this slide, I want to uh, shortly talk about the difference between the schedulers, message brokers, and I have a separate column for built-in methods, uh, which means that uh, just for uh, your observation, how we can build our own methods and inject that directly to our API and how bad this approach is in comparison to these two technologies. So basically uh, the scheduler is just the technology that allows you to asynchronously uh, schedule jo different jobs that uh, will be run at the some period of after some period of time or at some certain period of time or based on some predefined rules. And it always um, executed and maintained uh, on the same host as your main application. While the message broker is the technology that allows you to communicate between different deployable services. Uh, if we talk about, for example, like microservice approach, it will help to communicate between those services by defining some sort of contractors. Uh, contractors. So uh, we know beforehand what message we uh, should consume. And we know beforehand the consuming logic on a, a consumer side and what we should do with that set of data that came to us from the client. So it's sort of a middleware between one service and another service. Well, one service is a client and another one is a consumer. 
And let's talk more specifically about some key differences between these two technologies. So first of all, uh, let's talk about the queuing. As I already mentioned, we can uh, schedule uh, we can schedule different jobs with a, a standard scheduler. And also we can do that with the message broker. So uh, we can create uh, some sort of uh, queues where we put the different jobs or the different events, and we can process them uh, separately and define our own rules uh, and our own logic, how we can uh, and want execute uh, different uh, methods and uh, process with different events depending on the queue where it's located. Uh, while we cannot do that uh, or build in methods, so of course we can implement something really weird, but it's not like a good way to pull it. Uh, scalability. Scalability is uh, always a problem if we will go in with uh, something custom. And it's kind of problem with schedulers because as far as I know, no, uh, scheduling library is, uh, uh, supports the auto scaling uh, things just like uh, from the box. Uh, while the message brokers, uh, all of them that I've been working with uh, are pretty well defined and can be easily out of scaled on demand. So it's not a problem for uh, this type of technologies. No external services needed. Of course, it's not true for both of this technology because we should rely on a new framework or completely new technology that is written even on another language. We should know beforehand how we can and want to deploy this, how we want to maintain this. So it can be a pain for uh, like your DevOps team, especially if they're a rookie in this field. So that's why we've been rejected by introducing the real message bus or message broker uh, technology. Um, ensure completion. This is the key point in my presentation because it's really important to know uh, the status of your job or uh, your event that is consumed uh, on the other side. Uh, it's, a, it's key thing to know uh, whether it was failed or completed. Uh, and based on that information, you can introduce new metrics, uh, login stuff. So both of these technologies supports the uh, status management stuff uh, just from the box, which is beautiful. And um, schedulers overall is not really easy to uh, build on top of the uh, existing workload balancers, which I'll be talking a little bit, uh, a little bit more in my next slides, which is not uh, true for message brokers because, like as I said, message brokers uh, such as the Kafka or RabbitMQ, uh, they're pretty well defined to work with uh, various uh, load balancers. It's not a problem to define a uh, uh, approach for message brokers at all. Uh, persistent and uh, is it to use uh, there are two points that are like a little bit controversial because for some uh, people uh, neither of that technologies uh, uh, are hard to understand and to work with uh, but for myself I I'll say that uh, I had some struggles when I firstly met with uh, RabbitMQ in my case and then I worked with Kafka in my experience so I put it false because message broker is highly complicated thing and uh, you can do a, a lot of things uh, with them, but it's it takes time to fully understand its power. And uh, scheduling. Yeah, the only thing that you can do with schedulers that is not available for any of these two approaches is actually a job scheduling mechanism. So the thing is that you can uh, wrap up your a piece of code that you want to run on the background and define a set of rules uh, based on which you may want to execute this job. So you can say that uh, this job is recurring job. So it will be run each time, each day at the same, at the same time, or it should be run after some period of time or after some rules are passed which is the really powerful thing if we're talking about the schedulers, schedulers overall. And the status monitoring mechanism uh, or shortly dashboard is available for both of these 
technologies, which is beautiful because we uh, we can have a separate subdomain or even a separate domain when we can log in as an admin user and see all the reports, all the stuff that are related to all of our queues, jobs, events, and et cetera. So knowing all of that information, uh, let's switch to our implementation. So we decided to use the Hank Fire. And uh, this is our current um, and agreed uh, diagram of uh, data transfer flow. So this part remains the same. The only thing is that we have introduced the Hank Fire, which uh, allowed us to create a Hank Fire servers. And the Hank Fire itself should know the way of how to put the job uh, into the queue. So it should have some mechanism to store that job before they uh, started processing. For this needs, we've uh, used uh, Redis cache, but it's not obligatory to use only Redis. Hank Fire can work with uh, other technologies. Uh, I'll show you in my next slide. But for this list, we decided to use Redis and we of course have a replica Redis uh, set here. But overall, uh, this is all that we've introduced uh, in terms of the uh, architecture for our DevOps or uh, data transferring. And uh, let's move forward and let's talk more about the Hank Fire itself. So what is Hank Fire? The Hank Fire is open sourced library, uh, which represents a simple scheduler that is implementing the fire and forget approach. What does this mean? It means that we have a Hank fire client and a Hank fire server. The Hank fire client is basically your code that you uh, written before and from which you want to schedule your jobs. So your client side just create a job and uh, with help of uh, the Hank fire uh, library uh, puts the job uh, to the jobs repository. In our case, it's Redis cache. So uh, the job is being serialized and put into the Redis and the result will return to you immediately, which means that your main thread will continue working and uh, with no interruptions, your uh, like core service logic or your API overall will continue uh, process and in the same way as it was before. The next step is that based on some set of rules, the Hankfire server will search for the job in the jobs repository. Uh, once it finds the job, uh, it, it was returned by the jobs repository, start processing it on the same host as your main application is run. And uh, uh, what's about the jobs repository, what it should be and what it should look like. The Hank Fire supports two different technologies uh, to use as a jobs repository. One of them is the Redis cache uh, that we've decided to use. And another one is uh, just the standard MS SQL server. Uh, the beauty thing with the Redis is that, first of all, we've already used that uh, in our application for different needs, but Another thing is that with Redis, uh, you can have more flexibility in auto scaling process, which I'll show you uh, a little bit later. Uh, whether the Microsoft SQL server as any, almost any SQL servers is not so easily to auto scale and it will cost uh, pretty much more in terms of your budget. And let's move to the more practical examples and the real implementation and the real world examples of how we can use the Hank Fire to build a message bus-like approach in monolith architecture. So the starting point is as always the installation. So uh, those are all of the Hank Fire uh, related NuGet packages that you have to install before you're able to work with, uh, with that technology. Uh, none of them are obligatory because, for example, that Hank Fire Pro Redis is used only if you're using a Redis cache as your jobs repository uh, instance. If you decided to use the Mass SQL server, you will have to search for another package um, in uh, NuGet. Uh, but all of the other are pretty common and uh, required. 
for example, the main uh, thing here is the hink fire core, which allows you to manipulate with different uh, jobs to define your uh, set of rules to wrap up your code with different attributes. And uh, this thing, uh, the hink fire throttling, uh, it allows you to manipulate with different threads because I'll mention that a little bit later, but uh, the thing is that each job in a hink fire will run in a separate thread. So you might want to synchronize your threads with uh, some synchronization mechanism, such as a, 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 like the, the standard ones that allows uh, you, that allowed you by a .NET, such as a semaphores or uh, whatever. And uh, this thing is provided uh, to you uh, within this hank fire throttling you get package. Uh, let's move forward to the hank fire setup. So this is pretty much it uh, uh, to start working with hank fire. So in your startup class, you just need to write up several lines of code. Uh, the first one is, and the most important is uh, this one. Uh, this is just the um, static class, the hink fire setup, and you have to call the setup global config method and put the config file, uh, the configuration that should set the uh, public IP address, the port uh, that will be using for the dashboard um, and uh, the admin uh, username and password to log into that dashboard. Another thing is these two methods, use hank fire servers, this is uh, the standard one methods to define the different queues within Hank Fire. For example, one of them we defined by ourselves and uh, you can call it whenever you want because it should return uh, a simple string here. If you uh, do not do that, it will create a standard queue, which is called default, and all of the jobs will be put into that queue, which is not the best way to manipulate with uh, um, a big set of jobs using hank fire. So you, uh, you may want for sure to define your own queues right here using that extension method, use hank fire server. And that's pretty much it for the hank fire setup and installation process, which is Pretty cool, I think, because it does require a lot of time to do and uh, big knowledge uh, in that field. And uh, let's move forward to the exact implementation. So as I've mentioned before, we've used uh, Hank Fire to build our message bus like approach. So basically we wanted to have a interface that will have only one public method, which is a publish and it will take um, one of our uh, events, the event is just basically uh, a class with uh, different with different uh, properties within it. And it will uh, handle those events based on some set of uh, logic. So this is pretty much it for the publisher side. Uh, we should define the publish method here and the key points uh, right now is to these two lines. So the first one is that we actually create a job for the Hank fire by calling this uh, two methods. This is the standard methods from Hank fire core uh, namespace. And it will call the handle event method, which I'll show you. And the thing is uh, that we will handle that event just right here. So since we have a monolith approach, we are we doesn't need to create uh, the separate uh, modules or separate projects uh, for the client side and consumer side. We'll just create a job and that job will handle our event just right away. Uh, and the next thing is that we create a queue and put that job into a, a dedicated queue using uh, some configurations uh, such as our like tenant that we want to run this job within. Um, and let's uh, forward to our handler. So the handler is uh, 
you can think about it as a consumer side. So this was the client side and this is the consumer side. So once we wrapped up our uh, event into the handle event uh, method, it will return uh, the uh, it will return the result immediately. So nothing really happens right now, right here. So this method will return uh, the result immediately to your uh, main source code, to your main thread, and it will go uh, right in uh, continuously as it was before. The main thing happened in the handle event uh, method, which is right here. So basically, once the job is scheduled, and uh, the time's up and it's been picked to execute by hand fire, it will go to that handle method, which does some sort of a validation and it will call, uh, I, I'll call it like a broadcast event method. Um, this private method used is used uh, the uh, C-sharp reflection mechanism to find the exact handler that we also have to define because we should know somehow uh, how to process that event. So what we gonna do when that event is paired. Uh, when some uh, event or when some exact type came to the hang fire and it started processing it, we go to that log and with help of reflection, we find uh, the exact handler that we want to use. If we found that, we do exact the same actions as on the previous step. So we create another job to actually handle it. So we wrapped up uh, our method, our handler uh, into the hang fire job. And then we again create another queue or put uh, a job into the existing queue with uh, some config and that's it. So it will return response uh, just right after that. And uh, the actual handling will happen at the same time after that, based on your own rules or the default rules of a hang fire. And uh, let's see the real usage example. So for example, you may want to inject your logic into the core service, which is pretty uh, like sort of a legacy code. And uh, the only thing that you need to do is to inject your iHankFire bus uh, interface here and call this method. Uh, you have to create your event, for example, like contact updated event, and then call the publish method with and pass that event to here. And that's pretty much it. All the other stuff will be handled by the HankFire. So the response will be returned immediately. Then after some period of time, it will start processing uh, and it will found the appropriate handler. And after that, it will create another job to actually handle your event. And uh, this can be introduced uh, using this simple diagram. So in your main app, somebody just called your API. Uh, it will start processing. And at some point, it publishes an event to a Hankfire server. Hankfire server, schedules a job uh, for searching a handler and put it to Redis and returns the response immediately. And that's it. So your main application, your API that has been called will just continue working uh, from that point in the same way as usual. So we're not going to call this code anymore. Uh, everything that will happen after that will be on the Hankfire server side. So uh, after some period of time, Hankfire server will pick up and execute the searching job. This job uh, will find an appropriate event handler and that event handler uh, with a predefined uh, handling method will be wrapped up into a separate job and uh, which uh, will be scheduled once again and put it to Redis. And then after some period of time, the hang fire picked up and executed an actual handling job uh, from the Redis and it, it actually be executed uh, after some, some period of time right here. Um, let's talk about some more details about the various hang fire usages and different sticks and tricks and how to work with that technology overall.
So as I already mentioned, uh, you may want to create your own job queues. It's pretty easy to create once you predefine that and configured your Handflyer server and the startup class. You just need to wrap up your uh, method in uh, your handler by this attribute, which is called just queue. And here you should pass a pretty just a string. So pretty much everything that you need to just hard code string or create the enum and put it here. Another another thing that you may want to use is uh, the amount of automatically tries. So once your job is put to into the queue and it was picked up and uh, executed, it may fail for some, for various reasons. And uh, by default, Hankfire automatically tries to uh, recreate the call. So retries to execute the same method 10 times in a row, which might be uh, insufficient for your needs because you already know that some system exception occurred and there is no really, uh, really important reason to retry those attempts. So you can set it um, explicitly to zero, so which means that once your Hankfire job is failed, it will generate a report or it will uh, log some information into your external login provider or whatever you want to do with this. And it will not um, uh, execute it once again, and it will not uh, use uh, additional resources to uh, retry the execution. Uh, another beautiful thing is the latency timeout. This is uh, the set of rule that you may want to use to specify after which period of time once the job is being queued, you want to execute it. So uh, in our case, after 299 milliseconds, I expect that this job will be picked up and executed regardless of the order in the queue, regardless of the um, importancy of HQ. Uh, so this is the example of your custom rules that you can define to tell Hankfire how to properly process your job. Uh, and the login stuff. Uh, another beautiful thing is that you have the beautiful Hankfire dashboard where you can find out all of the information about the various queues, servers, workers, um, jobs, and you even can lock your stuff just right into the dashboard with uh, only one simple namespace um, usage, which is Hankfire login. Uh, but of course, beforehand, you have to specify uh, in your config uh, as usual, the log level, uh, the default, uh, the default doc level, which is like more in our case, and uh, Hankfire specific uh, lock level, which I think is sufficient to just uh, put it information. And you can lock all the info related to that job, not in your uh, login provider, which is uh, which might be insufficient because it uh, cost consuming, but just right into your Hankfire dashboard, and that's how it. Uh, looks like in a real world example. So uh, I can say that uh, if something is wrong, I can uh, say that uh, I should throw a warning uh, log here with this message and uh, with a lot of another messages such as like uh, publishing a new record here, then some uh, tech information here and that the publishing is completed. So everything will be locked in the Hankfire server and uh, can be accessible with your admin credentials right there. Um, and let's talk about the concerns because uh, I know that it might look pretty easy and like uh, overkill for uh, a lot of various scenarios, but it also has a lot of concerns. The first one is the scalability. As I've already mentioned, you cannot easily out of scale the Hankfire servers. So on this screen, you may see uh, the various of Hankfire servers and each of them uh, can have up to, two, to 30 uh, different workers. And each of uh, worker can be linked to a separate queue. For example, like the most highly loaded server is this one. It has 30 workers. 
and they spread across all of these queues right here. The thing is that Hankfire um, cannot create uh, additional workers or servers based on some rules. You have to know that beforehand and specify that into the config or you want to probably define your environment in that way that it will automatically recreate your main app instance along with the new Hankfire server, which might, might be a pain. And um, yeah, this is the big bottleneck right here. So an important concern to consider before you start working with Hankfire. Another thing is the disaster recovery. Um, the bad thing about the hack fire is that once it's been crashed for some reason and restarted, it doesn't save uh, the current state of each of the jobs that uh, have been executed at the time, which means that if some job uh, were about to execute or in the middle of execution and uh, the disaster happened, when you when your environment is already uh, up and running, it will go and do all the same actions and it will execute uh, your job once again from the very start to the very end, which might have unexpected results. You all, also, if you're manipulating with the different entities uh, and with databases, so you may be faced with the duplication of data uh, there, which is another concern that you we want to consider. Another thing is the long running jobs. Hankfire doesn't like the long running jobs because it is the pretty much uh, CPU and memory consuming. So that's why in my example, we divided uh, the process to for finding a handler and the process for actually handling an event in two separate and for jobs because we faced with a lot of issues where finding an appropriate handler and actually handling a job all together in one hand fire uh, separate job might uh, might take a long time and it will fail if uh, no available memory or uh, CPU uh, is available for the hand fire. Uh, another thing is the async jobs. Uh, the tricky point here is that the hack fire are not pretty like familiar, not familiar, but not pretty uh, well defined to work with um, uh, synchronous code uh, because it is used for each of the job, it is used a separate thread so that for each of the calls, you have to add this thing, configure await false. I'm not gonna, uh, dig a little really down into that topic. But if you do not specify this, you may find uh, an expected result when you, your asynchronous code was not awaited properly in your handlers. So this is another thing that you have to always memorize when you're working with asynchronous uh, jobs uh, using the hang fire. And uh, last but not least uh, is the entity framework entities cache. Uh, the bad thing, uh, but not the bad thing, but the, the interesting thing about the hack fire is that it serializes everything related uh, that is related to the job. So you may want to define your handling job in the, as much simple, uh, simpler manner as it possible. Because if you pass uh, to your job like a whole bunch of entity framework records and like iQueryable uh, collection or even I enumerable collection, which is materialized, you will see that everything is serialized into a JSON format and is put in the Redis, which you have to pay for. So your Redis uh, instance will be loaded with uh, a whole bunch of different lists of different entities, which is not what you expected to see. So this is another concern that you may want to uh, to think and to talk more before you start working with Hank Fire. Um, so uh, the last point is when to actually use the Hank Fire and that approach that I've introduced you. Well, 
first thing is, of course, if you have a monolith solution as we did. So we faced with that requirement, we have a monolith solution and we had to figure out some way of how we can introduce something, something unusual, but something workable. Uh, another thing is that when you have to quickly adjust your core logic with some atomic services and do not uh, increase uh, the cohesion, coupling, and do not increase different dependencies between your projects in a solution. And of course, if you do not have a budget to a complex architecture, I'm talking about the cloud providers, if you do not have a budget or you do not have an expertise in uh, different realms, such as uh, different uh, serverless even uh, things in uh, Azure, different ways of um, deploying uh, message brokers, different instances out of scaling, you may want to uh, look into that topic as well. And uh, of course, if you need the solution that just works as uh, it was in our example. So uh, it works, it works pretty stable, it is robust and uh, it is easy to understand, to implement and to maintain. Um, so I think that's pretty much it from my side. Um, any questions uh, or comments?